Well, we heard from Dr. Leila Mariate that powerful thank you for what you gave us in the overview. Um, I, I won't reintroduce you, but she's a physician, uh, heritage from Gaza. Now she can't go back, but her work with Kinder USA is still uh, trying to get us engaged with helping the situation there with families, with children. So, Leila, again, we thank you for being here. Thanks. 15 minutes? Or 10, 20. 20. Oh, okay. Thank I'll you so much. I'll give you five minutes and a two minutes. Okay, great. So we touched upon some of the issues. They're all interconnected with everything that we've been talking about. And this is really, like I said, affecting the health and well-being of everybody, particularly the children. I, we talked a little bit about the <coughs> mortality, uh, morbidity and mortality rates with respect to infant mortality. Does anyone know what the average life expectancy is of an adult male in Israel? Guess? 75? A male in Israel, a Jew, an Israeli, it's like 80. And for a, for a woman, it's 84. In Palestine, life expectancy has increased, but it's 70 for men and 74 for women. Again, as I mentioned, these are big picture sort of benchmarks, but they are indicators that, that you, we look at when we're looking at public health policy, particularly when you're looking at goals for improvement, and then looking again, like I said, at maternal mortality, how many women really should ever die in childbirth. At my hospital, it's unacceptable when it happens to anybody. We had three deaths last year, um, none of which could have been prevented, but it's still very devastating. So when you're looking at these high numbers of that or infant mortality or uh, complications of childbirth, it's something that we are looking to eradicate throughout the world, but that things are going backwards when it comes to Palestine and the West Bank. Again, it's part of an overall system of neglect uh, because they cannot get the services that they need. When you're looking at general health, uh, and you're trying, the problem is sometimes it's hard to get information, to get data, and I don't want to sort of just resort to statistics because I think sometimes that uh, depersonalizes the situation. But the problems relate to things like anemia, and not overt malnutrition per se, but what we would call micronutrient deficiency. And if some of you may remember when they started the siege in Gaza about a decade ago, the Israeli position was we don't want people to starve. We really can't have yeah, pictures yeah. of starving children. That's not good for PR. We'll put them on the diet. We'll have a minimum amount of calories that they need to maintain so that it doesn't look like we're starving them. But really, in fact, they are starving them in so many other ways. Um, the other problems that relate to general medical health, as I talked about, probably first is access to adequate health care. The Palestinian Ministry of Health is really quite good at uh, uh, distributing immunizations in partnership with other organizations like the WHO so that you have like a 95 to 99 percent immunization rate for basic immunizations. But as we develop other vaccines that we're putting out there for hepatitis C, for example, or for the human papillomavirus, those are not available. It's really basic things like measles, mumps, rubella, polio, what have you. Uh, and it's accomplished a lot and, and that's something that they really do have a system in place for, even in Gaza. Uh, primary care and secondary care, uh, more difficult. You'll see numbers that say that 95% of women go for prenatal care, but what is the actual quality of that care? 99% of women give birth in the hospital, um, but they still have issues because of what the services themselves can actually provide. And if any of you have been to hospitals, there's the Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, Nasser Hospital is like a government hospital in Khan Yunus, the town I'm from. You know, it's really, it's amazing what they are able to accomplish. And I think that the, the, the illnesses on some level might be uh, less because of just the robustness of the population. There may be a genetic component that helps people survive as well. All of these things are factors that can't really be studied well because of a lot of limitations in terms of getting the data. The environmental factors, we've talked, <clears throat> Tony talked to us about water, sewage, the contamination of the aquifers. Interestingly, uh, you can use chlorine to help, right? But chlorine's not allowed into Gaza because it's a dual use right. item because, because you used in explosives. Yeah. So even to try to fix the problem that's created by the sea, you can't solve it. So you, can, you get the sense when you step back a little bit, like this isn't a mistake, this isn't a, 
you know, just, oh, because this is a security threat. There is so much more, it's so much excessive, and, and it's part of the overarching policy that we see of this, number one, collective punishment, and number two, disproportionate. We use the term disproportionate use of force when you see the bombs going, you know, in, uh, uh, in the attacks, like in Protective Edge, but even things like this, the disproportionate effort to, to, to make things so difficult for the people there. What is really going on? You have to stop and think about it. In terms of the quality of health care, um, it's, you know, what kind of training do people get? Well, oftentimes the doctors there may have gotten their medical degrees from an Eastern European country. Do they have something that really does accreditation? They have medical schools in Gaza. How much and how consistent and how well is the training done? These, you know, there's the tremendous effort that's put out. You have groups that try to go to do this training, but there's only so much you can do if, if you're not able to move back and forth. Um, you know, I've had some tragedies in my own family. Again, another relative, her son, who's 16 years old, developed an infection that was misdiagnosed. He was mistreated. He died. Um, you know, at 17, he couldn't get out for treatment. They're in Gaza. They can't get permission to go to Israel. To go to Egypt is really difficult. And, and sadly, he passed away. And when I would hear the story, I'm not trying to judge or second guess, but I do realize there are limitations. My uncle passed away in Gaza about two months ago. Um, he had also developed complications of an infection. They didn't have the right antibiotics to give him. They didn't have even the tubing that he needed for the IV. By the time he went to Egypt, he was in a coma and they couldn't save his life. Mm. So for Palestinians, this is sort of like, this is our fate, this is God's will, this is my time. But really, we would not accept that no. here. We would not. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's really part of the issue. Even diagnostic tools, the quality of labs, things, when you start to get down to it, as a clinician parsing it down, can I order an MRI? Can I order an ultrasound? When I went to Gaza to visit, I worked with this one gynecologist. She had an ultrasound that I remember using when we were in medical school in the 80s. The quality of the imaging was so poor. Could she get parts? Could she order one? Can you deliver it? Have you tried to send anything to Gaza before? So those are things that we sometimes don't think of, but those little details really do make a difference. The issue then really is, once you get the diagnosis, once you have the illness, what are the treatments that are available to you? If you have cancer, can you get the surgery that you need? Can you get chemotherapy? Sometimes in some places, they have such a shortage of medications, they have to split the dose or dilute it to share it with somebody else who has the same disease. You can't get radiation therapy in Gaza because, God forbid, they have the technology to use x-ray therapy for breast cancer because, no, they're going to use that to create a, like a nuclear bomb. That's the problem. So there's no, even in the West Bank, there is one hospital that, ha that does uh, provide cancer treatment, which is Augusta Victoria. Some of you may be familiar mm -hmm. with it. But where is it located? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. If you have to get permission to go and you'll look at numbers in terms of their patients and people having access to that hospital and even that hospital's own viability, uh, but it, it still has the challenges compared to an Israeli hospital. So I'm an OBGYN. I read peer uh, review journals, ACOG, Green Journal. The quality of research that comes out of Israel as a, as a sort of a really superior nation in terms of medical care, medical diagnosis, research, is, is at the same level as the United States, and in fact, more some, in some of these studies. There's no re reason why that, that, if you say, if you look about this one state solution, that's what everybody should have access to. But without even the best intentions of the Palestinians to improve their health system, the barriers are so great that they can only get so far. Um, if you have problems, when I was there, the uh, incubators for the NICU, the NICU for the neonates weren't working. They couldn't get parts. They had donations of one machine from one country, another one from a different country, another one from someplace else. So they didn't even know how to work all of them because they had different parts. And when they malfunctioned, they couldn't fix them. To the point that the nursing staff was about to go on strike saying, we cannot work under these conditions. How can we, how can we take care of these tiny babies when the monitors go off and, and erroneously and we can't really tell what's going on with them? So it's these small things when we talk about them, the details. If you think about your child, your grandchild, your relative, these are intolerable. And it's only a few miles away where you could have the best medical care available. It's really no, no excuse. 
Um, but the biggest problem, or not, or one of the huge problems is the referral system, which we talked about a little bit, which is if you need advanced care and you can't get it there, where can you go? You, you would like to go to Israel. Everybody wants to go to Israel. Even the Palestinians in Gaza, they know they could get better medical care. And you also have a, a strong group of like, really conscientious medical professionals that will take care of the whole population. Um, Physicians for Human Rights Israel is a really important organization there as well. They don't really necessarily, if they could get out, they'd probably go to Israel before they go to the West Bank, but you know, really they'll go anywhere, whether it's Jordan, whether it's the Gulf, whether it's here in the United States. Sometimes they have to go to Egypt, but in all, in all, if they are trying to leave through Israel, which is the ERA's checkpoint, they have to get permission. And uh, last year they had about 166,000 requests for referral. This is between all together from the Ministry of Health. Israel denied or didn't answer 16% of them, which is a huge number. And so you go back and forth and back and forth, and by the time maybe you get the approval, your disease is advanced. And mm. it's, you're, now you're at a greater risk for increasing illness and possibly death. The other uh, issue that affects access is this back-to-back -back policy, you know, how they, you take an ambulance to the checkpoint, the patient has to get out of the ambulance, somehow be moved, to another ambulance on the other side of the checkpoint and then take, and you can have up to, uh, to an hour delay of care. And if you're in an emergency, an hour is a very long time. I'm just, just thinking of a patient I took care of yesterday who had complications from a miscarriage. It took me 45 minutes to get her from the emergency room to the, to the operating room. She had already lost at least half a liter of blood. So, so an hour is a very long time when you're talking about an emergency. So these are things that can't be minimized, and that's, I think, sometimes we talk about them in general ways that we don't really think, we have to think about them in reality. Pharmaceuticals we talked about, um, and, and that's another problem. When it comes to mental health, the, the need is huge, and it's probably underreported across the board when it comes to West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, everywhere. There is still a lot of stigma with, among Palestinians, among Arabs perhaps in general, uh, about admitting that you have a mental health condition, even among my own community here. If I say, yeah, you know, we have consulted with uh, psychologists, you know, raising teenagers, m maybe I think they're crazy, probably it's me that really needs the help, but, it's, but that's mm -hmm. what I, I've done, and I'll talk yeah. to my yeah. friends about using professionals to help us navigate this difficult time. And people look at me in a way that that's, that's a problem. So you already have that, so we probably don't report it, but what happens is, you have problems with anxiety, depression, PTSD, which can be reported anywhere from 25 to 70 percent of children and adolescents. Because of their high exposure to violence, some studies show that 80 to 90 percent have been exposed to some form of violence, either themselves, witnessing it in their family, their friends, just in general. Incarceration, property destruction or loss, th receiving threats, all of these things contribute to that anxiety, depression. I, just talking about it makes me feel anxious. For the Palestinians in Gaza, it's exposure to military aggression. Some kids have had been lived in this war situation three to four times in their lifetime. We don't even really know what that looks like. In another study, they had reported in this one town in the West Bank, 25% of the adolescents they interviewed had attempted suicide, and 25% had suicidal ideation. There's somatic disorders where you know your, your, your mental state affects your body and so you may have chronic stomach aches or headaches, things like that. You also have substance abuse that occurs, maybe 1% drug related, lots of tobacco consumption and other problems related to poor performance in school, nightmares, bedwetting, social isolation, aggression, hopelessness, helplessness, fatigue, and then just fearfulness and this issue of this lack of security. I'm, I'm not safe and my parents cannot protect me. Creates, adds to that whole level of anxiety. So how do you respond to these needs? Well, first there's the stigmatization problem, but then secondly, you do not have the resources. One uh, article I read said there's 20 psychiatrists in the West Bank. They do not have skilled personnel. They're looking at increasing like training opportunities for them. Uh, and also there's sort of this general uh, error in approach. So the outside approach is, let's bring you in, one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy, things like that. That doesn't really work in that system that's really community-based. And so when they asked a group of people how many of you would actually go to counseling, only 1% said that they would. And so it's looking at the cultural context, the role of the communal response and resilience, as opposed to focusing 
on the individual. Rather, it should be on supporting and developing existing resources with public awareness, education campaigns, social support groups. How do we help parents help their kids? If you're going to go to your cousin or your sister or someone else before you go to the Gaza Community Mental Health Center. At the same time, you can increase the number of professionals in that area where you could do group classes for those kids who are really in the greatest need. But it's a huge challenge that has to be viewed in this context. Um, and I think the cultural factors that negatively affect emotional development of children include other stresses on the family, especially economics. So if there's high unemployment and this affects the function of the family, there's depression, anxiety in the parents, there may be increased incidence of domestic violence and child abuse that doesn't get talked about very much in our community either. UNICEF has a program that's looking at that. But all those stresses of just the external ones we're talking about of the life under occupation impact the stresses of the family and its ability to function in, in a really difficult situation. I talked about the overcrowding, the impact that could have psychologically, but also uh, in terms of physical health, as, as in terms of transmission of disease. So all of these are important factors, and I will pretty much finish up with that. I think we could, we could pick any topic and talk about it more, but it really is you know, a byproduct of this ongoing, long-term, systemic oppression that comes with both the occupation of the West Bank and the siege of Gaza that, has, that does not look like it's going to end. There doesn't seem to be the political will. On that note, I will take my last minute or two to correct myself after speaking to Esty <laughs> with the Jewish Voices for Peace who chastised me for not reminding us all that really as you know, a part, part of a, what we still believe is a functional democracy, we should be calling on our representatives. We heard about your victory in Portland. These things, one thing at a time till we get to that tipping point, which is what we have to believe in and why we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Some people are better at some things than others, but calling our representatives, taking them to task, holding them accountable, being the thorn in their side, the bug in their ear, is something that we all can and should do. So I do, hopefully that's what you meant, Esty, right? But I just, I will end on that. Thanks. Okay.